This sermon was preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on November the 17th, 2024. It is entitled, The Endurance of Christian Ministry. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. This past week, we celebrated, commemorated, Remembrance Day. We thought of sacrifice, bravery, devotion, and dedication. We thought of people being committed to a cause and serving others, even at a cost to themselves. That is the same spirit that we see in the Apostle Paul. Paul sacrificed and demonstrated bravery because of his commitment to the Lord and to the proclamation of the gospel message. He believed that the gospel is the message of reconciliation, that all people need to hear, and also that God had commanded him personally 
to go and to proclaim it to the Gentiles. So with great boldness and integrity, Paul sought to fulfill the mission entrusted to him to the best of his ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this letter, Paul identifies himself as a servant of God. And that is a description of all true believers. All those who follow Jesus are servants of God. And there are different aspects to our service. But in Christ, this is our calling. And I don't always love when people refer to full-time ministry and the way it's sometimes referred to. Because we're all called to full-time Christian service. Whether it's a school or at work, in our homes, God has put this calling on each of us. And as we reflect on Paul's understanding of his service, we can think about how what he says in these verses applies to our lives as believers and as those who are called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever sphere we find ourselves in. The passage before us this morning, 2 Corinthians 6, 3-13, can be broken down into three sections, and these are very unequal sections. So we're, the first point is going to be short, The third point is going to be really short, and so when we're going through the second point, uh, don't worry. In talking about his ministry, Paul tells us first what he doesn't do, and then secondly, what he does do, and finally, why he does it. So what Paul doesn't do, and this is verse 3, Paul says that we, he and his companions, put no stumbling block or obstacle in anyone's path, so that their ministry might not be disqualified. This week I was driving and I unexpectedly came to a closed road. There was no prior warning. Just all of a sudden, the road ahead of me was closed. There was an obstacle between me getting to my destination. So what do we do when there's an obstacle in our way? Well, I doubled back, went around the block, and carried on beyond the obstacle. All in all, it cost me a bit of time, but I persisted because getting to my destination was important. But sometimes, an obstacle may cause someone to give up, to turn around and go back the way they came, and not to try to find a way past. Some translations say obstacle, some say stumbling block, and we know the idea of a stumbling block. It distracts the individual who's walking on a path. It causes them to trip, maybe even to fall down. It prevents them from walking well. Paul knows that preachers and Christians in general can be stumbling blocks or obstacles in the spiritual journey of other people. Jesus emphasized the importance of how we conduct ourselves and an awareness of the influence that we have on others. As he says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a profound and sobering comment. It's a terrible thing to cause someone to stumble, to impede in some way the spiritual journey of another person. And Paul understands the gravity of the situation and he is determined not to make anyone stumble. As he expresses his desire in this verse not to be a stumbling block, you can hear echoes of what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Paul says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in in its blessing. 
Well, before we think about what Paul is saying in those verses, let us first remind ourselves of what he is not saying. Paul is not talking about compromising on the gospel truth or on holiness. There are aspects of Christianity that cause offense because of the nature and content of God's truth and because of his standards of righteousness. And Paul does not shy away from being bold in declaring these things, even if it leads to rejection and persecution. That is not what he is talking about here in referring to stumbling blocks. His point is that his conviction is that all people must hear the gospel, and he will do whatever is possible to not personally hinder anyone from hearing and receiving the gospel message and from growing in their faith. Therefore, if required, he will forego legitimate certain certain practices, like eating meat, celebrating certain days, or drinking wine, if it will be a stumbling block for someone else. For example, some people so tied the eating of meat with idolatry that they couldn't conceive of a godly person eating meat. Paul did not share this conviction because idols are nothing. He knew that there was nothing wrong with eating meat, but if by eating meat he would cause someone to stumble, then he says, I'm never going to eat meat again. Paul is willing to give up his rights. He is even willing to endure hardship and difficulty and deprivation for the spiritual good of other people. He is intentional in not being a stumbling block so that his ministry will not be discredited, so that no fault will be found with his work. Not only is Paul willing to give up certain practices, but he is devoted to righteousness, to faithfully obeying Christ's law. He knows that a lack of consistency or of unrighteousness in him will damage his testimony and his ministry. Paul is an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he knows that he needs to conduct himself in a manner consistent with his profession of faith in Jesus and consistent with the gospel that he preaches. And that's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? To live a life consistent with our profession of faith. If Paul's conduct was incompatible or not aligned with the message and with Christ, then it would discredit his ministry and cause distress to God's people. And sadly, we see far too much of this. One of the most public and damaging ways that Christian leaders discredit their ministries and put stumbling blocks in the way of others is through moral failures, especially in terms of sexuality. A sin or a pattern of sin is revealed. It becomes public. That disqualifies an individual for ministry and the result is heartache for the church and confusion for believers. Imagine a young believer who has been blessed by a particular individual's ministry. He or she looks to the speaker as an influence, even as a mentor. And then the speaker is caught in a scandal of sin. The young believer is confused and distressed and is full of questions as the hypocrisy of the preacher is revealed. Faith is shaken. Distress results. Jesus is maligned. Paul, by the grace of God, will not do that. He himself will not be an obstacle to faith. Instead, his faithfulness and consistency testifies of his calling from God And since his ministry is legitimate and genuine, what he preaches and teaches is to be followed. So what Paul does not do, as he's thinking about being a servant of God, he does not put a stumbling block in the path of those he is called to minister to. But what does Paul do? Our second point, what Paul does do, and this will be the majority of our time, verses 4 down to 10. He does not do that which is negative, but he does do that which is positive. 
And how would you expect a servant of God, a faithful minister of the Lord to act? What qualities do you think should be evident in one who has been called by God and who is committed to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ? And Paul says these qualities, many of which he lists in these verses, are observable in his life and in his companions. What Paul says he does do is commend himself in every way as a servant of God. He invites them to diligently examine his life and his ministry. And when they do so, they will see evidence that he truly is a servant of God. And he is not self-serving or working for his own agenda. Now his use of the word commend in verse 4 might cause us to scratch our heads. Back in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul wrote, we are not trying to commend ourselves to you again. And here, he is now talking about commending himself. Well, Paul is, of course, too smart to contradict himself in such a blatant manner. Clearly, he understands that there are different types of commending. There is a sense in which he does want to commend himself and a sense in which he doesn't. Paul is not self-commended. His authority, his position, does not come from himself. It doesn't even come from other people. The proof that he is an apostle, a faithful servant of God. But it comes from God himself. Paul asks them to consider him an apostle based on the work of God in him that enables him to discharge his calling and to endure and persevere through the hardship of ministry. This section in my Bible is simply entitled, Paul's Hardships. Paul looks from various angles at the hardships that he endures in Christian ministry. And one of the marks of an apostle is that they will persevere. And Paul says that they are to look to his endurance as a mark of his genuineness. Now, taking a step back, why does this matter to us today? Why does it matter if Paul is a genuine apostle, a servant of God, or not? Well, three things. First, just like the Corinthians, we listen to his teaching. It is good for us to be reminded of the environment in which the gospel was preached by Paul and by the rest of the apostles. Their commitment, ability to endure, and willingness to sacrifice testifies to their calling from God. Just as the Corinthians were to listen to Paul, for he speaks with apostolic authority, so too are we. One of the negatives of a red-letter Bible is that when people see the words of Christ written in red, they might think that the words that are in black are secondary, that they don't carry quite the same weight. But that's not true. The entirety of the scripture contains the word of Christ. And the role of an apostle is one who is called by Christ to declare his words to the church. And Paul is saying that he is a legitimate apostle. And because he is an apostle, what he declares, what he has written, what is recorded, is binding upon us. To obey Christ is to obey the teaching of his apostles. And so it's important to know that Paul is an apostle because his teaching is authoritative. And second, Paul provides a pattern for Christian life and service. We can learn from his example about what it means to be a servant of God. We read earlier that Jesus told his followers to take up our crosses and follow him. Following Jesus will not be easy. It involves sacrifice and self-denial. And Paul details in this section the challenges that are inherent in Christian living and Christian service. He teaches us that we are to be willing to suffer for the gospel, but we are not to lose heart because Christ is worth it. Third, 
Paul's experience that he details here reminds us and points us to the power of God. Paul's ability to endure all that he faces comes not from himself, but from God. There are many things in the Christian life and from life in general that are overwhelming. When we see how Paul perseveres through difficulty, we are reminded that just as God was with him, so too will God be with us. We have the promise of God's presence. So with all that in mind, let us see what Paul has to say about his hardships and how his ability to endure is evident of God's power and of his genuineness, of his, and the genuineness of his calling as God's servant. So Paul says, I commend myself to you as a servant of God. So what specifically commends him to them? First, and if you're following along on the back of the bulletin, this section we're going to break down into five points, and the subheadings are on the back of the bulletin. He is commended by his endurance and suffering. Paul opens his list by saying that he is a servant of God in great endurance. Paul in his ministry is called to endure, and he does endure. When things are difficult, when the Corinthians are failing to show him respect or appreciation, does he give up? Is his understanding of his calling tied to how they feel about him? No. Paul knows that his call from God, and because his call is from God, he is to press on in his ministry. When Jesus first revealed himself to Paul, it was made very clear that his ministry was going to be difficult, that he would need to persevere, and that is what he has done. All believers are called to persevere. The nature of the Christian life is that it is difficult, and it requires us to press on with our eyes on the finish line. Again and again, we read exhortations to endure, such as, we are not to grow weary while doing good. We are to run the race set before us with perseverance. There will be many challenges and temptations to give up and throw in the towel, but we are to endure. Paul elaborates on his great endurance by then listing three triads, three groups of three, which illustrate his endurance. In great endurance, he says, in troubles, hardships, and distresses. Paul gives these three words which all describe the general need to endure because it's so prevalent. This is something that all believers will have to engage with, the difficulties of life. There are all sorts of troubles, hardships, and distresses that the apostle is called to go through as a servant of God. He frequently in this letter talks about his suffering. And he has already told them that his suffering was so great that it was beyond him his ability to endure, and so that he despaired of life. But God helped him and delivered him. We will face all sorts of hardships in life and for our service of the Lord. But God is faithful. He will be with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. So we may persevere in faith and in our labors for the Lord. The second triad in beatings, imprisonments, and riots. Paul's gospel ministry brings opposition from civil authorities against himself. Time and again, people try and prevent him from speaking and limit any influence that he might have through violence. Many authorities view the message Paul proclaims as a threat. It is a threat to their way of living. It is a threat to the fabric of their society. It is a threat to their life of comfort and sin. It is a threat to their own agendas and selfishness and their own power. And because some view the gospel as a threat, Paul has had to endure beatings, imprisonments, and riots. But these things do not dissuade him from declaring the truth. The gospel is so important that he will press on. And we read of his story in Acts, and it's Incredible to think of how Paul, in one city, endures beatings, 
or imprisonment or a riot results. And then what does he do? He goes on to the next city and starts all over again. And he does that because he's fully committed that he is in Christ and that he is doing God's work. And he is able to do it by the power of God. Because God is at work in him, sustaining him. And the final triad, he says, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. There is a physical toll to Paul's faithfulness. He works hard. He told the Corinthians that he does not want to charge them for the gospel. And so in addition to his missionary endeavors among them, he worked as a tent maker to provide for his own needs. So he works as a tent maker during the day and as a preacher during the evening. And just imagine all of the weight and exhaustion that is upon him. His priority, what is most important, is fulfilling his calling as a servant of God. And so he is willing to work hard. He has endured sleepless nights and hunger for the sake of the gospel. And it's not that he is saying that we should neglect to care for ourselves and ignore our need for sleep or food. That would be a wrong application of this text. The point is sometimes believers, like Paul, are deprived of these things in the service of the Lord. And he willingly endures them for the sake of Jesus. Paul is commended as a faithful servant of God by his endurance. And then secondly, he is commended as a faithful servant of God by his spirit-filled and grace-filled life. As Paul continues his list of qualities that are evident in his life and ministry as a faithful servant of God, he changes gears in verse 6 and into verse 7 by thinking now not about the opposition that he faces and his need to endure, but in the blessings of God, in the gifts that God has given to him in order to equip and prepare him for ministry. How can they be sure that Paul really is a servant of God? Because God has equipped him in order to endure in what he has been called to do. This image of the vine from John chapter 15, that we are to depend upon Christ. And Paul says, you see that I depend upon Christ, and he provides the resources for me to persist in ministry. And so he writes, In purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God. And we could spend a great deal of time going through this list, item by item, uh, detail by detail. But first of all, time doesn't allow us to. And second... We don't want to lose Paul's overarching point that all of these things God has given to him and they are evidence of God's calling on his life as a servant. He is a genuine servant of God because God is at work. God is at work by transforming his character, his mind, and his heart. God is at work causing Christ-like virtues to be present. God has given to him a love of purity, an understanding of spiritual matters, an ability to be patient in the face of all manner of trials, and a heart of kindness towards all people. The man who used to want to cause people to suffer and even die for their beliefs is now characterized by purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. Even think of patience. The impression we get of Paul before his conversion is that he was not a patient man. He was just ready, up in arms, to take the battle to Damascus. But now he's a patient individual. What a transformation of grace. The Holy Spirit is at work in him and has given him gifts and talents in order to serve the Lord in accordance with his calling. He says he does this in sincere love. He loves people like the Corinthians who give him much grief. He loves them with a Christ-like, sacrificial, unconditional love. He speaks the truth. He doesn't hide from them anything that might be hard to say or hard for them to hear, but he proclaims what he knows they need to hear. 
he ministers and serves in the power of God. He is weak. And it is only the mighty hand of God that enables him to do what he does. Paul says, look at all of these things. Look at how God is at work in me. You see his fingerprints all over my life. And these things testify that he is a servant of God. And no doubt, as he is giving this list, though he doesn't explicitly say it, he wants them to think about the false teachers about those who have infiltrated the church. Do you see the same godliness and work of Christ and growth in virtues in them that you see in Paul? Does their life commend them as a faithful servant of God in the same way that Paul's life and ministry does? And then what about us? God equips and works in us. But there is this balance between the gifts that God gives to us and our responsibility to use them, to grow in Christian virtue, to put these things on. Do you prioritize purity and understanding and patience and kindness in your heart and in your life and in your service to God? Is the presence of the Holy Spirit evident in you? Do you have a sincere love for other people where you genuinely want their best even if it comes at a cost to you? Is your speech truthful with lips that are full of grace and life and full of Jesus? Can God's power be seen through and in you? The Christ-likeness of Paul commends him as God's servant. And more than that, the Christ-likeness of Paul commends Christ Jesus to them. This is what Christ does. He makes wonderful changes in an individual's life, like he did in Paul. Christ shines through his people. People are to see God at work in us. And when they do, this causes some to desire to have such a work of grace in their own lives. They look at us and think, I want what they have. Our example makes our Savior attractive to some. Now some will be offended and mock and so on, but others will be drawn to Jesus. Our character, like Paul's, should make the gospel of Jesus Christ appealing to those around us. He commends himself as a servant of God to them. A third reason, way in which he commends himself to them, is by his readiness for battle. Paul likes to use metaphors which speak of the Christian life as a struggle or a battle. He emphasizes that living for Jesus is hard and challenging, hence the need to endure. And we are to make sure that we're fighting the right battles. Paul does not strive to fight with his opponents in order to vindicate himself or because he wants acclaim and honor from other people. But he is ready to stand and fight against the devil and his schemes, against the enticements of this world, and against false teachers who would lead the people astray. He commends himself as God's servant, for he is equipped with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. We are servants of God, he says, prepared to use the armor that God has given to us. And in referring to the weapons here, Paul may be thinking particularly of the spiritual weapons that according to Ephesians 6 would be in his right hand and in his left hand. The sword of the spirit in the right hand and the shield of faith for the left. He may have that in mind, or this phrase may be a more general way of reminding them that God fully equips his servants to engage in the spiritual battle. And the battle comes to all believers. There is a spiritual warfare, and the enemies of Jesus do not fight fair. So we need to be ready and on our guard. And I encourage you to read through Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 through 20, and remind yourself of the pieces of the armor of God that we have been supplied with 
and that we are to put on. Paul's preparation to engage in the battle for the glory of God and for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ commends him to them as God's faithful servant. Fourth, he is commended by maintaining integrity in all seasons, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. The Christian life and Christian service has its ups and downs. There are times when everything seems to be going well, and there is cohesion among God's people. Then there are times when nothing seems to be going right, and there are attacks and difficulties all around. The servant of the gospel will go through good times and bad times. They will experience occasions when things are going well and the glory of obeying and proclaiming Christ is evident. And there are times when serving and living for Jesus seems to bring dishonor and is exhausting. At either of these extremes and at every point in between, Paul endures. He presses on. And no doubt you understand what he is saying. In the Christian life and in Christian service, there will be times of delight and sorrow. Times when it is easy and popular to follow Jesus, and times when it is hard to follow Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, I've been reading through Pilgrim's Progress again, and one of the individuals that Pilgrim comes into contact with, or that Christian comes into contact with, is an individual, Mr. Byans, and he's more than happy to talk about religion and to follow Christ when it's easy and when that's the way of society and so forth. But when times are tough, well, then he doesn't want anything to do with it. And that's how some people operate. They're more than happy to declare the name of Christ when things are easy and comfortable, when it's popular. But when it's hard, then they hide in the shadow. Then they run away. We're to be faithful followers of Jesus at all times. This consistency commends Paul and his ministry to them. So they are commended as God's servant. And then, finally, in terms of this section on what Paul does do. He commends himself to them. He is commended by embracing the gospel paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to contradict itself at first glance, but upon further thought, it may be true. And Paul, in these verses, gives seven of these potentially contradictory statements but the statements which in Christ are not contradictory. So what he does is he highlights these paradoxes that are inherent in the gospel message. And these are not contradictions. Both items in each paradox can exist at the same time. And they do exist because we serve a suffering Savior. Our King was crucified and rose again. The promises that we have are that when we follow in the pattern of our Savior, we will contend with sorrow in the present, but we endure it because we look forward to the glory to come. And God's people, God's servants, understand, and not only understand, but embrace these paradoxes. We know that this is the way that things are in this world, and we're okay with that. We're okay with our present difficulties and call them light and momentary afflictions because we have our minds set on things above. We are looking toward the eternal glory which outweighs them all. So Paul says that he is genuine yet regarded as imposter. People will misunderstand and malign God's people as they did Paul and as they did Jesus himself. Some called Paul an imposter that he was not really a servant of God or an apostle. But he is a genuine servant of God, appointed by the Lord. And it is God's assessment, and not the assessment of other people, that really matter. He says, we are known yet regarded as unknown. 
We are known by God and by his children, though unknown by the world, because Christ has called us out of the world. Those who do not have eyes to see spiritually regard us wrongly. And we're okay with that. We're okay that people make fun of us. In Paul's case, he's okay that people will beat him and imprison him. Because what really matters to him is to be known by God as a faithful servant. We are dying, yet we live on. And Paul has already written in this letter that in his ministry, death is at work so that life might be at work in them. We, like our Savior, sacrifice ourselves. We take up our cross. But the message and we ourselves live on. We may die, but the church and the truth will prevail. And we have the hope of eternal life. He says we are beaten and yet not killed. There will be persecution, but our times are in God's hand. We will not die. We will not breathe our last breath until God sees fit to call us home. And even for those who are martyred for their faith, death is merely an entrance into glory. He says we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And this is one of those fascinating statements. The Christian is at the same time sorrowful and rejoices. We are sorrowful because we are grieved by our own sin, by the sins of other people. We are sorrowful because of the state of this world because we have a desire that people would know and love Jesus like we know and love him. But yet, even though there is an element of sorrow in this world, we can rejoice because Jesus lives, because he is the king, and one day he will return. For the Christian experience is one of sorrow, yet always rejoicing. It says we are poor, yet making many rich. We are poor in the eyes of this world. Paul did not have the things of this world. He had very little of what life has to offer. He didn't have a bank account. He didn't have a huge house. And yet, though he is poor, he makes many rich because he declares to them the message of eternal life. He tells them how they might live forever in God's kingdom. And many have received that message and have this great hope. He says, we ha- we're having nothing, and yet possessing everything. And this is similar to the previous statement. Again, Paul has nothing in the eyes of this world. But he knows that the things of this world are temporary. His hope, his confidence, is that in Christ, he will be a joint heir in the inheritance of everything. Paul embraces these paradoxes, and that means that he is willing to live his life and minister for Christ in the present with an eye to eternity. He lays up treasures in heaven. And so again, when we think of Paul's understanding of being God's servant, the questions come back to us. Do I embrace these paradoxes? Do I not only understand them, but live by them? Do I have such a focus on eternity that I'm willing to endure all sorts of difficulties in the present, assured of God's promises for the future? With all of this in mind, as Paul has detailed his ministry, he says that we commend ourselves to you. This is what we do. We conduct ourselves according to this manner, and in doing so, we show that we are truly God's servants. This is how God's servants act in this world, in this present age. And so much of this material searches us as we come face to face with what is entailed in following and serving Christ. And I encourage you again, take this, 
section and read through it. Read through it slowly. You know, I feel like we've just blown right, right through it because there is so much here. And this is a comprehensive picture that Paul is painting of being a servant of God that we are all called to be. And there's one more point, and we'll look at this one briefly. And Paul explains why he does it. Why he perseveres in Christian ministry. And the reason that he gives here is love. The church in Corinth has put Paul through an awful lot. They have hurt him. They have broken his heart. They've broken his ministerial heart. But they've also broken his heart as one who simply loves them and has devoted so much time and energy to them. But he presses on, not only as God's servant in general, but as God's servant for them. And he does this because he loves them. He has opened his heart to them. And when you open your heart to someone, you make yourself vulnerable. He opened his heart to them, and they hurt him. He has freely spoken to them of the things of the Lord, because he wants them to know Jesus and to thrive in their faith. And Paul says that we are not withholding our affection from you. All that we do flows from a heart of love. Even after they have treated Paul as they have. Even as the one who came and is their spiritual father, the one who proclaimed Christ to them, the one who spent so much time with them, prayed for them, urgently declared the gospel of reconciliation to them. And then false teachers come in who are discrediting Paul and they're led astray. And they doubt everything about Paul, the legitimacy of his ministry, whether he really is from God. They question, is he really serving God or is he just serving himself? Paul could have been bitter. He could have been angry. Think of what was going on in his mind. Could have been going on in his mind and his heart. He could have walked away. He said, if you're going to act like that, I'm going to want nothing to do with you. But he knew that they needed him. And so in love, he reached out to them. And he was willing to say the hard things, to make this painful visit to them to write the severe letter to them because they were in the wrong and they needed to be corrected. Now, love doesn't mean that he passively sat around and wrote them love letters or things like that. He said what they needed to hear. He tried to draw them back to a right relationship with God through Christ. And they did. That's the hope that we have in this, in this book, this letter, that they did respond positively they understood that these teachers who are influencing them are false teachers. And now that they've rejected the false teachers, Paul encourages them to restore their love for him. He says, my heart is still open towards you. I still love you. And he asks that they would reciprocate. There's no spite in him. He endures in love for God's people. And he knows that in Christ, it is right for them to love him too. Love is, of course, the great mark of God's people. We show that we know God, that we know the Lord Jesus Christ by our love for one another. And no doubt Paul wants to be loved by them because that will warm his soul. But in addition, Paul wants to be loved by them because he desires to see the fruit of the Spirit the fruit of love at work in their lives. Well, may we prioritize and grow in Christ-like love for each other. Paul knew all sorts of hardships. And a hardship which hurt him deeply was how he was treated by this church. Though they knew him well, though they had spent much time with him, he must remind them of his love for them, his calling as God's servant, and his faithfulness in ministry. 
as Paul brings these things to their minds, as he shows them the evidence that he is a genuine servant of God, he reveals to us what should be present in our lives if we, too, are God's children. And so, two final questions. And the first, are you a child of God? This is a passage that is written with the assumption that those who are reading it are believers in Jesus Christ. They are those who have believed in the message of reconciliation that we talked about last week. And maybe you have never repented of your sin. Maybe you hear a message about the difficulties of the Christian life and the cost of serving God, and you think, why would I want that? But Paul has been very clear. Eternal life, reconciliation with God, the forgiveness of our sin, is found in Christ alone. You remember the paradoxes. The hardship is only for a moment. The difficulty is temporary. But the joy and peace and life return. So, are you a child of God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And second, if so, are you a faithful servant of God? Do you avoid putting stumbling blocks in the paths of others? Do you conduct yourself in such a way that you could easily commend yourself to others as a servant of God? Are you motivated by love? The Christian life is not a sprint. It is a call to endurance. And there are many things that we will be called to endure through. But we can do so confident that God will supply all of our needs and he will help us every step of the way as we look forward to the glory that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. And our Father, we thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, this faithful servant, your servant, who teaches us what it means to be a servant of God. And our Father, though there's a lot of details in this passage, I pray that you would apply this word to our hearts, that we would be challenged and searched. And our Father, that we would go forth into this world as ambassadors of Christ representing you, and pleading with people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and find life in him. Bless each and every one of us, our Father, we pray. Equip us to do your work in Jesus' name.